We are back and we are continuing with our study from Romans and tonight we are in Romans 10 and the title of my message is Trust in the Living Word. So before we get into the Word, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your wonderful Word. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the Living Word. Thank you that you were sent to bring us new life, new hope, and that your life is impacting our lives every day. And we thank you for your love and your kindness. We pray, Holy Spirit, that tonight while, while we are studying your word, that you will breathe over our hearts and you'll bring new revelation, bring new life, and that it will impact us deeply and change us into the image of your Son. We honor you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. All right, so the theme of the book of Romans is victory. Um, Paul even says, surpassing victory through him who loved us, through Jesus. He says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus. Isn't that the best news ever? Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not in my problems, not the stuff that I struggle with. If I run to God, nothing can separate me from his love. But Paul has a great sorrow and an unceasing grief in his heart because of his brethren, the Israelites, who don't have the surpassing victory. And he's going to focus on that in this chapter. See, there are some Jews that actually thought that Paul was against them. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. He even says in the text, if it was up to me, I would be willing to be separated from Christ if they can receive salvation. He had such a passion for them. But he says the problem was that they had rejected the very one that God had sent for salvation. See, the entire Old Testament and the law pointed to Jesus. They are the ones that received it. It was all about Christ, but they missed it. See, all of God's promises are built on Christ. It's built on him as the cornerstone. But then Paul says they stumbled over that stone. It became a rock of offense to them. Now how does that work? How did they stumble over it? See, they didn't like the plan. They didn't like God's plan. The whole of Romans 9 we covered last week is that God gets to make the plan that he wants to make. God is God. Newsflash. God is God. He can decide. He can decide the plan that he wants to make to get us united to him. It's like when someone invites you to their home. They get to decide what time you are coming and what they are serving up. See, God is God. But they didn't like this. That's the dilemma. God made a plan for the unrighteous sinner to be saved. And the plan that he made was through faith, through grace, through his goodness. See, why didn't they like God's plan? Because they couldn't be the heroes of the story. See, there's a part of us that like to be the hero. We like to achieve. We want to conquer. And then we can credit it to our own fame. See what I have done. But God has decided before the foundation of the world that they who come to him come in faith and humility. And that's all about relationship. Because see, the basis of real relationship is always built on truth and humility. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with a person that always knows the best, always think they are the best, always think that I can do it and you're not as good as me. No one wants that, because that's not real, that's fake. But when you serve one another, we were at a wedding yesterday, and it's so beautiful when you see people coming to Christ and coming in the right posture, and we, where Paul says in Ephesians 5, he says, submit to one another in love. See, that's what we do. We submit to God in love, because he already gave himself to us in love as well. The problem was that they were hard of heart. And that's why Paul in Romans 9 brought up the hard heart of Pharaoh. Say that fast a few times. Hard heart, hard heart, hard heart of Pharaoh as an example. See, hardness, hardness of the heart will keep you from the promises of God. 
but God keeps on reaching out to them. We'll read in verse 21 where he says to Israel, all day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. God keeps on reaching out his hand. What does God want Israel to do? What's his heart with Israel? What's his heart even today with Israel? The same thing he desires for each of us. To believe, to have faith, to trust that God is for you, and that his plan is the foundation on which you can build your life. But we will see that it's not only that you should have faith, but whom you place your faith in as well. It's the living word that we put our faith in. So let's get into the scripture and then we'll break it down. Romans 10 from verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, speaking of the Jews. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says... Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely, they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses said, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me, speaking of the Gentiles. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people up to there. God bless his wonderful word. Such a powerful, important chapter that we are in tonight. And the first thing we need to look at is be subject to God's righteousness. See, in verse 3, we see that Israel did not subject themselves to God's righteousness. They tried to establish it on their own. And Paul says that they have a zeal for God, but the problem was that it was accord not according to to knowledge. Now you'll say, but they have knowledge. Here's the thing. They have the knowledge, but they did not operate from the correct and vital knowledge. He then continues to roll out the truth and the right knowledge that is needed for salvation. Now this is critical for us as well. See, what you think and what you know and what you think you know has a great impact on how you act what you are moving towards, and how you relate to God and your faith. 
See, this mo- we sing this song that says, I will make room for you. You've heard that before. It says, shake off the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. And people say, what is that about? See, the thing is, if you have a wrong perspective or a wrong idea about God or what the faith of what faith is, it starts to direct your life. And that's why it's so important what we're doing. We're working through the Bible, through the Word, verse by verse, so that we have a well-rounded knowledge of the Word of God. Because see, the thing is, faith in itself is not enough. I'll say, what? Faith isn't enough? Yeah, it's critical what truth your faith is based on. See, many have faith that is misplaced. Do you know that Islam radicals have faith? Buddhists have faith. Mormons have faith. Do you know that Satanists have faith? Even atheists have faith. They have to believe the truth that they are holding on to based on the knowledge that they are operating from. You see how dangerous it is. If your knowledge is wrong, if your truth is wrong, it directs your whole life. Life. So Paul continues to lay out the truth and the right knowledge to build your life on and to move from. So this is critical. This is critical to our faith as well, what we are built on. So he continues to say then, Christ is the end of the law. Now, many times in Romans we've seen this. Paul addresses this issue. It's as if he wants to imprint this on them so they would be steadfast on the right foundation and should not be shaken. He says, Christ is the end of the law. What does that mean? Does the law cease to exist? Is the law now irrelevant? See, some people have taken this scripture and said, well, praise God, we're free from the law. Now we're just under grace. We can do whatever we want. We just confess. We're free from the law. But that's not what Paul says. We know that the law is still relevant because even worldly society is built on the basic precepts of the law. There's still a law that says, do not steal, do not kill, do not, do not do all these things that the law tells us even in this world not to do. Even societies that are not Christian have this basic moral code written within their human nature. If you go to any tribe anywhere in the bush that hasn't heard even of society as we know it, if someone kills someone, that person is also killed or there is punishment. It's just the way it is. It's a moral code that is written into the heart of man. And it's interesting that it also aligns with the word. Now, that does not mean that all societies follow the moral law. But deep down, everyone ascribes to it. And you know what? Even in in our postmodern era with everyone, all these isms that are busy working and influencing and having all these things, all the humanisms and all these things, people might say, I don't ascribe to a moral law. But as soon as they themselves are threatened by someone else breaking the law against them, then suddenly they're up in arms and say, that's not right. There's a great illustration of this. Someone once said, because you know what, um, there's some atheists that, um, uh, atheist movements and things that they say, there is no specific moral code. Every person has his own moral law. And then someone told him, well, that's a great idea. I'm just going to get my gun and shoot you now. He says, you're not allowed to do that? I say, why? That's my moral code. I'm allowed to. No, that's wrong. According to who? See? As soon as you want to do something against someone else, then suddenly they say, no, there is a moral code. See, without the basic law as described in the Bible... There will be no guardrails for society. Yet, as we saw last week, the fleshly nature of man tries to break free. Even if not from all the laws, but definitely from some. Now, there might be some people that say, I'm not included in this. I tell you, everyone is included in this. Some might say, I don't murder. I don't swear. I don't steal. I don't do lawless things. But then if you ask them, if they sometimes look down on other people, 
sometimes envious of someone, sometimes coveting. Do you sometimes get angry and then lash out at people just that one time? See, although the law keeps the guardrails up, it is useless in regard to making someone righteous before God. Now, here's an interesting scripture. Verse 5 says, that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by that righteousness. Those who practice the righteousness of the law will live by that righteousness. Now some use this verse to say that by upholding the law, you can be righteous. You don't need Christ. But that is the wrong interpretation of what he said. What it means in verse, what it means in verse five is only a man who can practice perfect conformity to God's will and law with all of its intricate and minute demands for his whole life shall find life through it. So actually that verse five is disqualifying everyone. Everyone sins. Everyone is unrighteous. Everyone has broken the law. Even before you could remember, I told someone this morning, have a baby. It's like, uh, oh, this evening, the lady that's singing, they have a new baby, I think four months old. And as she walked off, she said, um, be nice. I said, well, doesn't understand. Baby doesn't understand what you're saying. Um, the thing is, even a baby, when they give, get their milk just a little bit, not on the right time, and they get angry, they start to... Scream, throw a tantrum, I want my milk, mommy. See, it's, it's born into us, this unrighteousness. We cannot do it without Christ. No one is perfect. By this statement, everyone is disqualified except one, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Because the sin nature was not in Christ. Only Jesus was able to fulfill and keep the fullness of the law. And therefore he was the only righteous one who could die in our stead and then by a gift say, I now give my righteousness to you. Only through him. So Paul did not say that the law ended and that we should now live lawless. He says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That's what the word says. End of the law, the end of righteousness. See, it is, the law is no longer the vehicle by which people try to be righteous because it's futile. The law only accentuated the need for a savior. The law leads up to him who is the fulfillment of all its types, Jesus. The purpose that the law was designed to accomplish was fulfilled when we look at righteousness. See, the righteousness based on work says, I will ascend into heaven and find the Messiah. Or I will descend into the abyss and find the Messiah. So what Paul is actually saying, he says, that is a person that says, on my own, I am going to try and make myself righteous. I will find a way to do this. It reminds me of so many stories that have been written based on one going on a quest to find help. If you just think of Lord of the Rings, there's trouble, there's a hero. There's even a literary saying for this. It's the hero's journey. So there's trouble and you have this hero and this hero has this character transformation as he grows and grows stronger and at the end there's victory and we say, yay Frodo! But the problem is, that is the thing of man. Man says, I will exalt myself. I will make myself better. I can be equal to God. I will get there. Sounds familiar? I will exalt myself above the throne of God. That's what Lucifer said. See, righteousness by faith does not say that. It does not focus on the own merit and your own ability. Righteousness by faith says, I am dead to trying on my own. I'm trusting not in my own merit or ability to be righteous. Now, what does faith do then? How do we get saved? Confess, 
and believe. See, the word of faith we are preaching is this. Verse 9, critical verse. If you've ever do, done an evangelism course, this is a verse that you will learn and you help people to come to Christ by this verse. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Now, yes, we can praise God. We need to understand this correctly though. There's a reason the scripture says confess and believe. See, many Christian teachings have erred, I, I wanna say Christian teachings, have erred by making a big thing of just confessing. Confessing in itself means nothing. It has to be aligned with the heart. I don't know if you've seen it before. There are many, many mob movies and things where you see this Italian mob and as they are doing all their horrible things and, and how they impact society. And I remember one time I saw a movie of this mob guy sitting in church, getting ready to go into confession. And as he does this, he texts someone and says, uh, you need to kill that guy. Boop. Sends and says, bless me, Father, I've sinned. It's been so long before my last confession. See, the heart is not aligned. Confession means nothing. And even from a different angle, you get people from another angle confessing and naming and claiming. I confess that I am going to be a success. I confess that God is going to give me a car. I confess and I confess and all these confessions. And they start to use confessing as a magic spell. God is a genie, and as long as I confess, God's going to do the stuff for me. See, it's not about just confessing. That's not the point. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus speaks to this. He says, this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, it's about the heart. The heart needs to believe. The heart needs to trust in Jesus. The heart, when we speak of the heart, it speaks of the center of your being, representing all who you are. And from that belief, when I believe in Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord, then I confess. But there's a, this confession is also very specific. It's not just about confessing what you believe, because even demons do that. James 2.19, you believe that God is one, James says, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. See, just believing is also not enough. I submit to you that demons even believe more than many Christians. Because they were there when Jesus was crucified. They were there when he rose from the grave. They were there when he triumphed over them. They still have the battle scars. They know that they need to submit to the name of Jesus. They believe very well. See, there's a very specific confession that it speaks of here. It says, confess him as Lord. This is important. It speaks of God's lordship over your life. See, many people don't have a problem asking Jesus to be their savior but many are reluctant to call him Lord. Because Lordship implies that you are no longer in control and Lord of your life. And that's why sometimes um, it hurts me to see how people sometimes say, I'm going to give God a chance. I'm going to try this Christian thing. I'll see if this works for me. I'll see if God changes my life. No, it's the wrong angle. The angle we're coming from is God, I'm lost without you. I'm a mess without you. I cannot do this on my own. You see, many people have tried to be Lord of their own lives and have made quite a mess of it. Can I see some testimonies? He knows, he knows better, he loves us. And as we submit to him, as we say, Lord, I submit to you. That is how I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart and that person will be saved. 
Now, by the way, how do we know that we are right? What we believe is right. That we are putting our trust in the right place. Well, see, maybe Islam is right. And we should all join Hamas and catch the next plane to Palestine. That's what many people think now. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. Maybe the Mormons are right. Maybe the Buddhists are right. Maybe the Hindus are right. Why are we right? How do you know? I would like to give one definitive answer. And that is this. We know we are right and we are standing on the truth because Jesus Christ declared that he was the son of the living God, the only one. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. And this truth is what we hold on to. And it's important because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men the most to be pitied. But Christ has been raised from the dead. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. See, it is critical to know that he has risen. And we know this because there are critical, overwhelming evidence of this. See, when Paul was writing this in 1 Corinthians 15, there were still living eyewitnesses in his time. There were people that were still living. People that knew what has happened. And therefore, because Christ has risen, he has made a way to the Father, and everyone ought to call out to him and be saved. In Acts 17, 30, he says, Having overlooked the times of ignorance... Since where people were ignorant, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent. Who should repent? All people. This is important. We're going to get into it now. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We tend to forget that there were many, many, many people that saw Jesus walking after the resurrection. It was import, uh, uh, impossible for them to suppress this truth. There were too many witnesses. So then Paul says, call on him and be saved. Now in Romans 9, we were in last week. It's often used as a proof text for theology that says that the verse that says, God will have mercy on knowing whom he will have mercy and harden those whom he will harden is taken to mean that God saves those whom he wishes to save and God rejects whom he wishes to reject regardless of their personal choice. We call that the election theology. But in chapter 10, Paul makes a point of saying, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Without distinction. distinction. All who call on the name. God wants all to call. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, this is critical of your faith as well. Because if you are in a place where you say, I don't know if God's going to choose me. I don't know if I'm going to be saved. Then you will live that way as well. You will always live in fear. Always live in anxiety. Am I going to make it? Does God really love me? But if we understand that I'm adopted as a son and a daughter because of the love of Jesus, it changes everything. See, we forget John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God had not sent the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He didn't say some of the world. He says he wants all the world to be saved. He says he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already 
See, the moment that you say, I reject Jesus, you've been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. One day we are all going to stand before the Father, before the hosts of heaven, and the God Almighty will ask, what did you do about the knowledge about my son? I sent him, he was crucified. The light of the world has come, but you chose to reject him. Why? What will your answer be? Because in that moment, there will be nothing that you can say. At the end, you will say, God, you're right. I was wrong. See, I consider it this way. There will be no one in hell who will be able to say, I wanted to be saved, but God, you put my name on the wrong list. See, you can have two responses. Two people can listen to exactly the same message. One person will say, I Choose God. Thank you, God, for your gift of salvation. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy, but I receive it in faith because I know that you love me. Thank you that you saved me. Thank you that you adopt me as your son. I receive forgiveness as a gift. Another person can say, I knew it. It's not my fault that I'm not saved. I believe that I'm not destined to choose God. My excuse is that God must know that I will not choose him. Doesn't make sense. It's circular reasoning. In all of that sentence, it is God knows that I don't choose. God has chosen that I will not choose him. No. God chooses that everyone be saved. He wants everyone to come. But the sad thing is, not everyone will. See, just because God knows the end from the beginning doesn't mean that one does not have a choice. Now, then also Paul says, faith comes by hearing. He says, not all heeded the good news, even though it was prophesied. He says that Israel had all the prophecies. Everything pointed to Christ. But they did not listen. And then he points out, Two ways that people can hear so that no one has an excuse. He says creation testifies. When we get to verse 18, um, this is a quote from Psalm 19 where it speaks of the voices of all creation declaring the works of God's hands. So that is what Paul quotes. Let's read, let's read that, Psalm 19, 1 to 4. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day after day pours forth speech. And night after night shows forth knowledge. And if you just look at the stars and you say, how did this happen? He says, there is no speech nor spoken word from the stars. Their voices is not heard. Yet their voice in evidence goes out through all the earth. Their sayings to the end of the world. See, we've already seen that in Romans 1, declaring that creation testifies that there is a God. And we call this general revelation. Now, how does this testify about Christ? How does general revelation that there is, there must be a God? We don't know who it is. There must be a designer. How does this testify about Christ? See, in Matthew 8, something interesting happens. Jesus calms the storm. And it says, the men were amazed and said, what kind of a man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, every miracle that Jesus did defied the laws of nature. Fish obeyed him and swam into the nets. When he broke the bread and the fish, which is matter, it multiplied. It's impossible. He walked on water. He defied gravity. He defied the rules of nature. Sicknesses were healed. Storms obeyed his voice. I don't think, we just read over this, guys. If there, if there is this thunderstorm, hailstorm, it is just havoc. And someone steps onto the scene and say, 
be calm. And suddenly it's just, whew, and it's clear skies. What would you think? Oh my word, what type of man is this? That even nature listens to him. They could not refute it. Even dead people, he raised the dead. And no one could refute it because Lazarus was walking among them. He was dead for four days. He stunk. He stink, stank, stunk. Lunk is like a skunk. <laughs> That's why Jesus waited four days. Because the Jewish custom was, after the third day, there's no more hope. He cannot be sleeping for more than 72 hours. He is dead, deader, deadest. Jesus raised him. This confirmed him as Lord. He is the only one with authority over nature and creation. The only one that, only the one that created something can command it. Only he had the authority, even Lord over death. And once again, in Paul's time, while he was writing this, they were living eyewitnesses who saw all these miracles. And Paul even told his readers in some of his letters to go and confirm it with living witnesses. Don't take my word for it. There are living witnesses. And that's why people just turn to Jesus. Those with a heart that was looking for salvation turned to Jesus. It was a no-brainer. And see, because of this, because we have this knowledge, we can also build our faith on these truths. Jesus is real. He has risen from the grave. He is Lord of all. Can we praise him? Hallelujah. But then we also see, listen to the word. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. See, faith comes by hearing what is told and what is heard, preached, and received from the mouth of Jesus himself. And this is why we spend time in the inspired word of God. See, as you hear the message of, for example, righteousness, your faith grows. Every time you hear, I am righteous, and you get evidence from the word, your faith grows. As you hear the message of justification and salvation, your faith grows. As you hear about the love of God, it replaces the lies and your faith grows. When you hear about the promises of God, your faith grows. Now, this is a continual thing. Because we have many things and forces against us that want to destroy our faith. I don't know about you. But as we are going into the latter days, there are many things that want to destroy our faith. And just because you heard about, for example, righteousness before, it doesn't mean you never have to again. You know, people, people might say, I've heard this sermon before. We're we talking about righteousness again? I'm just going to zone out for a moment while this pastor's on his trip again and think about something else. No, we need to continually hear this. Has it been engraved into your heart and into your soul and into your spirit in such a degree that it defines where you are going, that it changes and transforms who you are? That's why we need this all the time. All of us need to be reminded continually of all that is in the Word. Because the Word of God is different. It's different than any other word. It is living. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. It reveals things in our lives. It changes us. It lays bare the hidden things of the heart. I have so many times over the last 20 years, people come to me and say after a service, Pastor, did my wife call you? Why did my wife tell you, you were preaching just for me this morning? I said, no, it's not me. It is the word that cuts deep. When the word goes out, the spirit starts to hover and move over your heart. And it brings truth. And it brings revelation. And it brings you to a place of surrender to God. See, Jesus is the living word. And his spirit is what is testifying and preaching and continuing to preach. That's what's different when we speak the word of God. His spirit quickens it. It brings life to our hearts. 
it transforms us and changes us. And when we put our trust in his word, not in ourselves, his word speaks righteousness over us. His word makes us righteous. His word is what changes us when we start to trust it. I'll trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. Amen. Finally, as for Israel, God says, all day long, I've stretched out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. You know what? God did not leave you. Even people that are running from God, God continues to stretch out his hand to an obstinate people, saying, I love you. I want you to be saved. This God even tries to stir them up. God provokes them by giving this message of hope to the Gentiles. Stirs them up. I tell you, sometimes God might even stir you up as well. He might even stir us up as well because he won't give up on us. Through every situation, through everything, God can use it for his glory. But the call tonight is don't resist him. Don't do, Paul says, what Israel did. Don't stumble over this cornerstone. Don't say, God, I'm going to try it on my own. God, I'm going to be the hero of the story. No. Receive by faith. Receive his love. Receive his grace. Thank him. Love him. Trust in the living word. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you came, that you are the living word that walked among men and that your words transformed this world forever. The words spoken to your disciples as it was written down. The words you spoke to Paul. The words that you breathed in and how we changed and moved and still changing and moving our hearts. But Lord, thank you that we know that this isn't just dead words on a page. That as we read this, Holy Spirit, you testify. You are the one speaking and changing and moving on our hearts. The Spirit of Christ still today at work in us. Thank you that we can hear you. Thank you that we can trust in you. The one that never fails. And we honor you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody says...